Thanks. Hello, everybody. Um, so you heard this morning some of the theory and the background to where we are with disability and equality now. Um, you've heard great practical examples of organisations that have been very successful in making sure that their services are accessible to as many people as possible. So what I'm going to talk about now is just a bit in the middle. If you're working in a public organisation and you want to make sure that you can be as accessible as possible to as many customers regardless of age, size, ability, disability, then we want to be able to make sure that you have that information available to you. At the moment I'm the only thing that stands between you and a cup of coffee so I'm going to keep this relatively short. Also I'm the Accessibility Development Advisor. We have the accessibility knowledge. We want you guys to have that accessibility knowledge available to you as easily as possible. So, fairly straightforward, we made a website, it's accessibility.ie. What we did with this website is we want you to be able to access it, we want this content to meet you wherever you are. If you have anything that can connect to an internet, no matter what size it is, um, you'll be able to use this easily. The website will adapt itself so that you're able to use it quite easily. If you're in a meeting and a question comes up about accessibility, if you have your phone, if you have your iPad, your iPad excuse me, a Kindle, anything else, you'll be able to get this information quite easily. If you want to play along, as I'm showing you all of these, um, feel free to take out the phones. Siobhan has already asked you to make sure they're silent, so please with that. But you can feel free to take out your phone, go to accessibility.ie or whatever other advice you have. If you want to use the Wi-Fi in here, the password is Americano. So that's Americano, all lowercase. So I'm going to bring you now through um, just the various steps. We only have about 12 pages on the website because we want to keep it as simple and as focused as possible. The first one, and it's massively important, is to commit to providing accessible services. So we've visited a lot of public bodies. When we talk to the staff there, they say we really want to improve what we do. We really want to make sure that all of our customers can come in, that nobody feels discriminated against, that our buildings are welcoming, that all of the staff know how to talk to people. But sometimes you wouldn't necessarily know it as soon as you look at somebody's website or as soon as you come into the building. So if you've committed to making your services accessible, tell the whole world about it. State your commitment. Ideally get as senior a person as you can to sign off on that and then put that somewhere where everybody can see it. Tell your customers what to expect as well. So we heard the example earlier of a solicitor who had a premises that wasn't fully accessible but who was prepared to meet people wherever they wanted to be so that they would be able to access his services. And if that's the position you're in, if you're in a building or if you're using a website that you can't immediately upgrade to be fully accessible, let people know about that. Also, collect feedback. And feedback has been mentioned already this morning. Get feedback from your customers. See what you're doing right. That will encourage you. See what else you need to do. And then see if your customers have good ideas for how to achieve that. The next thing, and this has been mentioned a few times already, is to provide disability equality training to staff. And we'd like to see an ongoing programme of disability equality training, not just something that's part of initiation that staff will get once and then maybe get rusty on over the years. We'd like to see a programme where every couple of years somebody is going to have to do this as part of their PMDS or something. And as has been mentioned, we have an e-learning centre, completely free, very educational, and very importantly, it's something that everybody pretty much enjoys when they're going through it. You can also find an experienced trainer to give that personal touch. If you're going to do that, try to find somebody who has worked with other public bodies, who has worked with disability groups, and who's speaking from experience. The next thing, and again a hugely important one, is to consult customers with disabilities. So ask people what exactly their needs are. There's a danger that if you don't ask people what exactly they need, you might misunderstand what you think they need. You might misunderstand, you might put all of your resources into something that doesn't actually do what they want. It might be something else, and it could be very straightforward that they're looking for instead. When you consult people, whether it's online or in the building, if it's going to be face-to-face, -face, make sure that it's accessible. Make sure people are able to get in and then get out quite easily. A low enough time, people with disabilities in some cases will need to, um, they might only be able to meet you at certain times, they might have a lot of other things that they have to do. Try not to impose any very tight deadlines on any consultations. People will want to reflect and um, to discuss with other people in similar situations about how your project could impact their lives. And treat the meetings like any other meetings, set an agenda at the start so everybody knows what's going to be discussed, and then send minutes around afterwards so that everybody has a clear idea of what was talked about. The next thing is to consider accessibility when procuring. So 
you've, a lot of you here have probably sent out requests for tenders already. There are a whole lot of legal bits that you usually include in there, bits about freedom of information, bits about health and safety, other laws and so on. We like to see Section 27 of the Disability Act 2005 in there. That says that when a public body are going to procure any buildings or services, any goods, they're going to have to make sure that they're accessible to people with disabilities. It does mention some exceptions and they're clearly outlined and we show those on the website as well. So when you have a request for tender, you can state accessibility. You can find out from our website and from the ICT procurement toolkit that we have on our Centre for Excellence in Universal Designs website, which sort of standards you should have. So when you're getting a new website, a new building, a new service, whatever it is, there's probably a standard there already. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Just find what that service is or what that standard is for the service. Mention that. Say that the service that you're procuring must meet that particular guideline. <coughs> And if necessary then, if you don't have the expertise in-house, you might want to find somebody else who's going to be able to help you, who's going to be able to check that the building or that the information is going to be fully accessible. The next thing then is to include accessibility in a customer charter. You probably have a customer charter. Again, state your commitment in there. Make sure that people can see it quite easily. Promote your complaints procedure. Nobody likes to get complaints, but they do kind of make you rethink about the services that you provide and how you accommodate your customers. Or now, I've written customers on this slide a few times. That should probably be citizens, as we've heard earlier today. A very handy thing to do is to promote multiple ways that customers can contact you. Some customers can't or don't like to use the phone. Some customers can't use email. Some customers might not be able to come in to meet you face to face in your building during business hours. So the best thing to do is to just have a variety of different ways that people can contact you. And then you can contact people back in the same way. Then it's very important for staff to understand what's in the customer charter, particularly about accessibility, and then to reflect on how that affects the work that they do and the service they provide. We've heard from two very successful access officers today who've done great work. They're also part of access teams. So it's great to train up your access officer. Your access officer should know the information that's contained in this website because it would be very helpful to them. And then you can have a very diverse access team. It's very useful if you can have as many different um, levels of seniority and people from as many different departments within your organization as possible. It means that you can share knowledge across your organization when you're discussing how making something accessible in your organization is going to affect you. You'll hear from people who are in other parts of the organization as well. It'll make your team much more successful. It's good to have regular meetings. Ideally, try to have them monthly or every second month or something so that you don't lapse on any of these. And what's great then is if you can meet your customers in disability groups and then again find out what's going well, what's not going so well and what are the particular areas you need to focus your limited resources on. The next thing then is to make your services more accessible, to consider the difficulties that your customers might have and then to ask them directly what you could do. On this page on our website, I won't go through it right now, but we talk about different um, different types of disabilities people have, different situations such as waiting rooms before people go to get the service that they're looking for, and we discuss a few tips to make sure that you can provide your services in an accessible way. Later on, one of my colleagues is going to be talking about Building for Everyone Universal Design Approach. That's a fantastic publication that goes into great detail about how you can make your buildings very accessible to people regardless of age, size, ability or disability. We have some brief information on this page as well as links to that publication. And we just go through a few things to keep in mind about your buildings. Things that somebody, even if they're not qualified architects, can just walk around the building and check just to make sure that it accommodates as many people as possible. We like to see public buildings audited every three years. That's a reasonable time frame, we think. And we have, um, again, we link to this from the website, we have guidelines for what to expect when you're getting your building audited. So in there it shows um, just a number of steps that you might need to go through. First, what to expect when the person's there, how to make sure it all goes well. And we have a template for a report then, which is quite important. Because if you're paying for somebody to audit your building, or if one of your staff is using their time to audit the building, then you want to make sure that the results that you get back are not just a list of things that are not going well, but things that you can actually address. So you can create an implementation plan where you say, here are the things we need to address first. Here's the person who's responsible. Here's how we're going to go about fixing it. And here's when we want it to be fully accessible. So your implementation plan will discuss how exactly you're going to address all of those. And you can make this information available to your customers as well, or citizens, and you can make sure that people understand the good work that you're going to do, so they, they won't be discouraged if they've had a bad experience with any of your buildings. We also like to see access handbooks, and these are living documents that contain regularly updated pieces of information about 
everything to do with accessibility and your building. For example, a, rule, a list of rules that um, keep the building accessible. Don't store photocopiers or photocopier paper in the middle of your corridor because some people need the full width of the corridor as they're travelling down it. Um, you might have an accessible toilet. You might write in your access handbook that the cleaners are not to store vacuum cleaners inside there. So again, we have a full template for the access handbook, so you can just download that. It's a straightforward Word document and just tailor it to your own organisation. You'll find that very helpful. In a lot of cases, you'll find that your staff have all of the information that they need. They have it in their head. It's stuff to do every day. It's great to just get it written down somewhere. This one then, extremely important, plan safe evacuation for everybody. So it's great to make sure that people can get into a building. We're very concerned with making sure that people can get out of the building as well. Personal emergency egress plans are very effective. They're called PEEPs for short. And what you do is you make sure that anybody who may have difficulty in getting out of a building in an emergency has a plan that's detailed for themselves, for their own conditions, for the buildings that they work in, and for the way that will be best for them to exit somewhere in the event of an emergency. We like to see people having at least two evacuation drills a year just to make sure that it will all actually happen on the day. And a very interesting one that you can discuss in your own buildings with your own staff is can people use lifts in emergency situations? A lot of the perceived wisdom out there is that you can never use a lift because the lift is too much of a risk. In some cases, a stairwell might be a risk in that it might take somebody much longer to get down the stairs or they might just not be able to get down the stairs. So a stairwell might be much more risky than a lift is. So what we like to see is, if possible, lifts can be upgraded so that they're much safer to use in an emergency situation. Or it could be taken as part of just the, the general emergency planning that you have, that you look at how much of a risk the lift is, what the other risks are, and you make sure that it can be used in a sensible way. There's a picture of an evacuation chair behind me. Evacuation chairs are brilliant and they have saved many lives. But just keep in mind that some people cannot use evacuation chairs. Some people, because of their condition, because of their disability, will not be able to use an evacuation chair. So basically, don't just install an evacuation chair and assume that then everybody will be able to get out of the building in an emergency. Right, the second last thing I want to talk about now is making your information more accessible. And it's great to focus on the information that customers need. And we've heard already today about trying to move away from jargon and information and language that's specific to your own organisation and thinking about what your customers need. We like clear user-focused language and the handiest thing to keep in mind, now we have guidelines on the website about this, but in a nutshell, just write the way you were taught to write in primary school, then everybody can understand it. Just the boy kicked the ball, straightforward. Not the ball was kicked by the boy. Not all staff and colleagues are kindly advised to please be aware of the fact that the ball seems to have been moved. Just make it really straightforward and as many people as possible will understand exactly what you mean. So we heard about the different alternative formats that are available from a large organisation like Revenue. You don't necessarily need to have all those different alternative formats for every piece of information that you produce. In fact, you probably don't if you're in a smaller organisation. You do need to know how to get them. So another thing that we have on the website is a template that you can download and that you can fill in. And what you do is you fill in, for example, if somebody asks for Braille, where you go, what the contact details are, how much it's going to cost, and then how much you think, um, so how long you think it will take somebody to get that. So if a customer does ask for something in, say, Braille, or somebody is looking for sign language interpreter somewhere, instead of just saying, I don't know, um, I'll look into that, I haven't heard of this before, you can say, here's how long it's going to take, and we should be able to get that to you within two working days or whatever. It's great to have an accessible information policy as well, and to make all staff aware of that, so the staff know that Providing information in alternative formats and in clear language is something that your organisation do and that there is an obligation to do it. Right, the last thing then is to make your websites more accessible. So Minister Howland mentioned this morning the number of services that are now available online and we have to make sure that as many people as possible are able to access all of those. The great news is that there are guidelines, they're quite specific, they're very straightforward and they're the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0. We've summarised those as a series of questions. We're saying, here are the 14 questions, and this is all on the web page, here are the 14 questions that you need to ask about all of your web content. Now, websites have a technical side to them. You might need to get outside expertise in. Um, you might have to go to some of your staff who are more savvy with this. But one thing that you can do, and we provide an exercise, so you have a bit of homework now from this talk. One thing that you can do is to learn to use word processing software properly. 
to structure all the information and to give it meaning because that's much more useful to people who have disabilities. So somebody who wants information in larger print or somebody who's going to listen to information being read out by a screen reader or just who's going to use a different device will be able to understand it much better if you've structured it all in the first place. So even if you never work on the website, if you just use Microsoft Word or one of those other word processors, you should know how to, for example, specify a heading as a heading not just make it look a little bit more like a heading, how to make lists and tables properly instead of just making them look a bit like lists or tables. It's good to audit your websites. Every 18 months or so is a good idea. And again, when you've audited something, you can develop a plan from that. So from the audit, you can say, here's the plan we're going to do. Here are some bits that we don't have the resources to address now. And here are other bits that are easy wins that we're able to fix quite easily. From your audit then you can basically tell the world what you've done and what you haven't done. It's good to audit as soon as possible and then you can be honest with the customers and say, look, this part of the website doesn't work yet. We hope to have it improved in six months. In the meantime, call into us or phone us here or here's a form that you can fill out. The main thing is to let people know how exactly they can get that service. So if it's not going to work for them online, that they'll know how to get that somewhere else. Right, so that's it. So accessibility.ie, um, I hope you all tell people about that. Um, you guys have given up your time to come here this morning, so you've kind of bought into the idea of making things accessible already. We hope that you'll use this to encourage your colleagues, to encourage people you know in other public organisations to understand a bit more about accessibility, see how straightforward it can be, and to make your services and buildings and information as accessible as possible. Thank you. Thank you.